very great privilege to be here this morning and especially to have a fireside chat with His Excellency, uh, Minister PTR, I hope, because he really explained to me what is the the best way to introduce him with the initials of his full surname. Uh, the minister is Minister for Information Technology and Digital Services, Government of Tamil Nadu, India. As far as I understand, because it's a state that I have, I have not managed to visit until now, and I hope I'll do that pretty soon in the near future, is uh, the second largest economy, Tamil Nadu, of a state in India, targeting double-digit uh, growth rates and make it India's ideal investment destination. Of course, there are a lot of more things that I can say, but I strongly support and believe that the, the ideal person to speak about that is His Excellency. And uh, with this uh, very, very short introduction, I'm addressing the question to the minister for explain, speaking to us for two main things about Nadu Tamil, what it is, why it's uh, just the, the so important uh, state of India, how it is growing, and then we carry on with the discussion. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you all of you being in Greece, and because uh, India and Greece are two countries with a lot of history, a lot of heritage, and a lot of uh, growing business. Minister. Thank you very much first for, for inviting me and for uh, being such a good companion on this discussion and to all of you who have attended. So I think I might start with just giving a bit of context of Tamil Nadu. Uh, it is one of many states in India, but a bit unique. As was mentioned here, that is the second biggest economy. But I should start by saying that uh, we're only about 5.8% of the population. We're roughly 10% of the economy of India. Uh, we have relatively high levels of urbanization, uh, relatively high levels of digital penetration. We produce about 18% of India's engineering graduates annually. Uh, we're about 80 million people, about $360 billion economy. Uh, and most remarkably, 42% of all women who work in the formal manufacturing sector in India work in Tamil Nadu. So this is a quite exceptional uh, state in terms of both um, social justice, inclusion, and economic progress. And I should probably just cap that off by saying that this achievement is a result of, in my understanding, uh, over 100 years of a policy of inclusion, of ensuring that women, all communities, all religions, were given equitable access to education, to employment, to property rights, and therefore we have uh, over a, a century built the human capital and we have benefited from two large transitions in India. One was the liberalization process of the 1990s. Uh, Tamil Nadu's GDP relative to the average soared after the 1990s. And again, the great uh, globalization and integration of India into the global economy. Uh, we were able to benefit from having the human capital that could leverage that kind of opportunity. So that's the broad context of uh, Tamil Nadu for those who may not be as familiar. So, would you be kind enough to explain to us for how many years are you running? Are you really running the, the state? And what exact, in, in which exact area you just uh, invest in most of your time besides the digital uh, transformation of the state? And because as, as far as I'm concerned, the digital transformation is what really 
supporting the growth of the economy and everything. And uh, by asking since when you started and for how long you, still, you are still going to run, because I know always our countries, they are depending on elections. <laughs> and sometimes the elections is not the greatest thing that is happening, because if something is really progressing, etc., it has to stay and carry on the further de development and attract investors because that's the main story. Yeah, um, I'll start with that first. I'd say that uh, you hope that on average the people are wise enough to elect those who are bringing progress. So though sometimes we think we do a good job and maybe we don't get re-elected, uh, I'm still for democracy, even if it means that every now and then there's a bit of uh, tumultuous shifting. Although you, having had, said you that, had recent elections. Yeah, having well. said that, I haven't, I haven't uh, lost an election yet, so <laughs> maybe I'll feel a lot worse after <laughs> I lose an election. But uh, in this particular portfolio, again, I'll, 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 since we have a bit of time, I'll put it in context. We have benefited from almost 100 years of continuity, irrespective of which party has been running the government, has been elected to run the government. That's probably one of the great things about Tamil Nadu is that from the 1920s diarchy under the British uh, pre-independence regime onwards, uh, roughly the same policies of inclusion, of education, of uh, equitable access, of reservation, of uh, job um, preferences, etc., have been in place. And when regime changes happened, if anything, good policies have been doubled down on. And I'll give you the classic example. We first started giving free lunch to children who come to school, elementary school, in um, the 1920s, because we saw that it was two-way beneficial. One, it increased the likelihood of attendance, and two, that uh, it basically increased the nutrition so people would learn and grow better. And so irrespective of economic status, everybody is getting a nutritious meal. But over the years, then sometimes it was stopped for lack of funding, then it started again. But in the many governments that have come and gone of all ideologies, it became from select schools and select classes to uh, all schools, only those below the poverty line, to all schools, irrespective of need, to all schools uh, and protein by giving eggs. Uh, in other words, a country which is not so rich and so, you know, only vegetarian food is given. So over four or five iterations, the program has gotten stronger and stronger. And this time our, our government came three years ago we have also started giving free breakfast because we found a lot of people, their mothers were not able to feed the children before they came to school. A lot of children were coming to school hungry or coming late to school. So we started elementary schools uh, giving free breakfast as well. Yeah. So this continuity of policy has been a great advantage to us. In my own case, our government uh, has in this version only been in office for three years, since 21. From 21 to 23, I was the minister for finance, pensions, uh, public sector enterprises, personnel, administrative reforms, planning, development, uh, economic statistics, most of the administration. It was vital because I'm a former banker and because at that time the fisc of the state had been continuously deteriorating for seven, eight years prior to COVID and then COVID made things really bad. So it needed some structural reform in the finance and, and administration portfolio. So that was my job for the first two years. Um, I was able to, with the support of the chief minister, uh, make an unprecedented turnaround in the finances, reduce the revenue deficit by more than half. First time in the history of the state, in rupee terms, borrowed less money two successive years in a row. So uh, once I'd achieved that, then my chief minister shifted me to this portfolio. This portfolio, again, Tamil Nadu used to be number one in the country, clearly. But in the last 20 years, for various reasons, mostly for lack of attention and lack of funding, uh, we have fallen behind relative to the Bangalore's, the Hyderabad's, maybe the Pune's, Delhi's, which have invested a lot more uh, into this sector. And that's because Tamil Nadu has a very diversified economy. Of course, agriculture is the backbone for all of us, but we have a lot of advanced manufacturing, automobiles, um, electronics assembly, textiles, footwear, the, the trade away from China, for example, has seen huge new investments into Tamil Nadu. 
uh, iPhone production, sneaker production, we've had huge increases. And we have a, a very high kind of graduation rate from school. So we have a, we have a large workforce. So in the IT, IT enabled services, R&Ds, uh, Chennai, which is my capital of Tamil Nadu, is still the number one patent filing office in India by a lot, has been for 25 years. So those, because we have such a diversified uh, economy, we have not been one trade focused and uh, one industry focused. And in fact, because we have maybe 10 or 15 cities over a million people, mm -hmm. most other states don't have that. Even Karnataka has maybe two cities worth uh, mentioning of scale beyond Bangalore. Uh, Telangana has almost none beyond Hyderabad. But Tamil Nadu has probably 15 cities over a million plus. So again, there's a diversification within Tamil Nadu. As a state, we're probably not badly off. As a city, we've fallen a bit behind, and we need to fix that. So that's what I was shifted here for uh, a as, year and a half ago. As you really, right now, presented and explained, that great background of yours, and especially having good knowledge of the banking sector as well, is what is comprising the development of this transformation of the state, digitalization, etc. And uh, you mentioned the education, which yeah. is the most important. And with the latest te developments of technology, and especially AI, that is uh, the new fashion, <laughs> if I may, may uh, use this expression, yeah. all around the world, because everybody's speaking about AI, Although AI was existing many, many years ago, since probably 1971 or 73 or something like that. Yeah. Right now, we got, uh, with the development of technology, we got much more uh, opportunities to carry on, not only with the education, but yeah. with the rest of the system, everything. And another thing that uh, is well known, because I have uh, co cooperated with uh, with India, I don't know if it was your state or somewhere else, been uh, serving as uh, president and uh, managing director of a uh, multinational company. Uh, I strongly believe that uh, you are very ahead of this uh, direction, especially, and involving the culture as well. Now, would you really believe that uh, the developments of the technology will make your plans about developing further and attracting investors is uh, a great support, is an aid, or you believe that uh, whatever, because you are already in a very improved stage, no, I mean, I think, you know, at least I should adhere to the topic of the, uh, of the original uh, printout. So I can talk about a few things, five or six things we're doing in the digital transformation and digital investment space or attracting IT investment. Um, I'll start with infrastructure first. We're in the process, like many states, but ours was a bit delayed in some ways and a bit ambitious because of that, because the cost of fiber came down a lot. So by the end of the year, we hope to have connected all 12,650 villages of our state on a fiber optic uh, broadband network and to offer to every uh, household uh, in the local um, villages at 100 Mbps, maybe between two and three US dollars a month uh, bandwidth, you know, 100 Mbps bandwidth access. This is very important to us because uh, we have some experience in the cable TV and TV business. We were the pioneers. We gave every household a small kind of box TV set, and we provide a government-run cable service at a very subsidized cost, like less than $2 a month. And this, we believe, gives universal access. There have been a lot of studies showing that things like domestic violence uh, came down a lot after women started to be aware of what the cultural norms were around the world and not just in their village. So. Given our experience, we want to have this broadband access because so much of education now is through online learning and it is beyond any debate that the access to online learning videos makes a big difference than text or uh, you know, mm -hmm. web pages or things like that. 
So I think that's the first infrastructure. The second is that we want our talent to be uh, more geared towards the market. So including in my industry, in my ministry, we have something called the ICT Academy. We have invested heavily in upskilling, reskilling, exactly. or skilling to the current needs, like prompt engineering, mm -hmm. like uh, deep technology. And so we hope that that makes our human capital, which has got large scale, even more attractive because it's got the right skills in that scale. I think the third thing is that we are trying to encourage a lot more innovation and startups because in this age of technology, if you have smart people and, and good connectivity, the ability to scale, particularly with cloud services that can be bought on demand, is quite high. So we want to create an ecosystem of, of um, innovation. We have startup support groups. We have missions like Startup Tamanoru. We have an it and hub in my department. But we also have government programs trying to seed capital into historically oppressed uh, communities. Uh, I used to run an entity called the Tamil Nadu Infrastructure Fund Management Corporation, which is an alternate asset equity fund. And there we have an emerging sector seed fund where we want to take stakes in startups and finance them and try to benefit from them. And then we, when I was in finance again, we started something called a sell to government day. So we find startups that have some product or service that the government can benefit from, innovative. We give them an exemption from the normal procurement rules, what we call Transparency and Tender Act, up to a certain limit. And if they can use the government to validate their model and we can use our order to grow their business and you know, uh, kind of uh, validate their business model, it's mutually beneficial, then we can also take equity stakes in them. So this is the broad concept. And we hope that if we do all this, including providing incentives, though we have historically not provided the kind of government incentives that Hyderabad or Bangalore have, we are increasingly contemplating doing that. And therefore, we will be able to get a lot of investment. Now, we've already seen results. Uh, I took over this ministry last year. Last year, um, good timing beats everything. Uh, the, the Class A office space, which is mostly IT, IT-enabled services in Tamil Nadu, went up from the normal 5 million square feet of new leases a year to 11 million plus. Uh, we see that momentum continuing. Our training departments are getting 3x, 5x the funding from corporates to train on the right products. So we see all this coming together. And um, I hope that in parallel, we will also use this technology to just answer the last part of your question about AI to improve the way government functions. Like, exactly. I don't know, there may be many bureaucrats or retired bureaucrats in the room. The average uh, ministry in, uh, in any state or um, the Indian Union government is running a vacancy rate about 40%. Mm -hmm. So fewer and fewer people trying to do more and more complex jobs as the population increases, the complexity increases. You know, the needs increase, you have a lot more age, aging people, you have a lot more health problems. And so it's not viable economically to actually scale the workforce anymore. It's already a very prohibitively expensive cost. Uh, there's a study that shows the average civil servant in India gets about 4x the per capita income. In most other parts of Asia, it's one and a half to two times. So we can't afford anymore. So technology can be profoundly transformative, both in terms of efficiency but also in terms of transparency, equitable access, removal of rent seeking, you know, avoidance of uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, gatekeeping, those kinds of things. And last word I want to say that AI is a big uh, potential, not so much as you say, this is the nth coming of AI, but the capacity to process voice really well. Exactly. And put that against really large databases and be able to come up with answers without human touch. So I've used this classic example. I say that, uh, uh, you know, 75-year-old person not aware of any technology without a smartphone should be able to call into a government number, say, am I eligible for program A? And with that person on the line, the system should be able to determine who they are, validate their eligibility, enroll them, and ensure that the first transfer happens into their bank account. That's the potential of AI. That's really the ambition we have for how we transform the government. Thank you for all that. And I'm really very happy that you mentioned startups, because that was my next question. 
because um, startups all around the world today are the, the uh, what is going to create the future jobs because jobs in the future in the very near future I'm not talking about the long uh, about the future after 10 or 20 years but I'm talking about right now yeah. uh, these the startups they are going to show to us what they are going to be the professions that we need to develop and especially for the younger generation because all around the world we're facing the problem of uh, ESG and uh, the green uh, yeah. environment etc and besides that the blue economy and so on on the other hand what uh, with AI and the latest development of technologies the benefit is going to be for the citizens because uh, all the governments to my humble opinion they have to just uh, make um, uh, the life of citizens not to be in line but online which means that they don't have to queue anywhere to, to get data they need in yeah, order yes, to carry yes. on the jobs I know that uh, India is very progressed on that there is no doubt but I believe with uh, whatever and especially your state can be an example yeah, we, we to, have moved a lot. Rest, to yeah. the rest uh, about that. And I'm glad, that, and uh, I believe that, um, and I'd like to ask you about that. Yes, within, start within the universities, have you created startups? Have you created this kind of things or, or not yet? No, uh, yeah. Because that's, I, they're, I think, supporting, I think we... they're supporting the university for the development, and uh, from the university is what is starting for the, the rest of the organization and the improvement of the state and the society. No, absolutely, but I, I want to go back to your first question. This notion of life should be online and not in a line. Uh, we started with something like 40 or 50 services. Now we have about 500 government services that people can access online. They don't have to come to a government office. They can either do it from their home, their browser. If they don't know how to do that or they don't have a computer or smartphone, they can go to a service center. We, I expanded it after I became minister from 8,000 centers to 30,000 centers. We're on our way to 50,000. And you can go and pay a flat fee like 50 cents or a dollar or 80 cents and get 500 services done for you online. And eventually we want to go to a point where even those few people who cannot come to a service center, already we've started a few services, the service will go to their house. So validation for pension or delivery of uh, mm -hmm. medicine for uh, non-communicable diseases, yeah. all this stuff. So uh, in line doesn't work for us. We, yes. Online is the only way to go. Yes. Now going back to universities, absolutely universities are the kind of hotbed for this to happen. And we have the great luxury, we have something like 20% of the top 100 ranked universities in the country, including places like IIT, Madras and Anna University. And we have partnered with them, the state of Tamil Nadu has partnered with IIT Madras to set up an incubation center, it's called the IIT Madras Research Park, which is in my view one of the best in the world and some would say as good as anywhere in the world, uh, where many unicorns have been created and where there's a lot of innovation. And you see, what it requires is the mindset. That, you know, I, I used to visit the Bay Area recent, uh, relatively a lot and now I've gone back after 15 years. The thing about innovation is that it requires an ecosystem of young, talented people exactly. who believe that they are limited only by their own, you know, uh, ideation and hard work. And because the internet allows infinite scaling, on, if you have a good idea, you can, you know, make it spread around the world. And the, the negative of that is it creates a lot of monopolies. You're seeing, you know, a lot of anti-monopoly action against Amazon and Google and Microsoft and Facebook and all that. So. You know, there's a negative to it in the, in the, you know, end cycle. But in the early stages, even a startup with five people and $10 million of funding, if they have a really good idea or a really good product, can basically scale almost infinitely. So absolutely, we need to uh, leverage the universities. And again, we're very fortunate that we have uh, disproportionately uh, the best universities uh, in our state. So around each one, we already have some. And it is my vision that we will expand such parks 
uh, into more places around the state and we will create um, joint ventures between the universities. And, I've got uh, another five minutes. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Yes, yes. That's what this one says. Yes, no, says no, minutes, yeah. <laughs> we, can, and, we have uh, somebody here that is telling us <laughs> and I'm coaching. And, um, I'm sorry about no, that. No, 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 no. So, I, yeah, I think, but we also need active participation of industry because they're the ones who are the cutting edge of some of the current problems. And so a lot of these innovation centers are funded by industry in universities. Exactly. And then we do that. Because universities are very important because they are the guys at the, at the place where all the research yeah. is taking place. And then the, the, the investment, the companies, etc. they can use that exactly. for the research. Would you mind if we ask the audience if they have any question for your excellence? Yeah, for the four uh, minutes, 40 is, seconds. Is any question, but do me a favor, just a question. Yes. Not, not, you know, very long, because we have only four minutes. Okay. What, what's your... um, do we have a micro? Is there any mic? It's coming. It is coming, sir. Just one second. <laughs> Could you please state your name and where you coming from? I'm, my name is B.M. Singh. I was uh, in the Indian Revenue Service. And uh, my question is to the minister, who I have be, uh, seen his speeches earlier and admired. You see, uh, you're doing a great job. All I can so is that Tamil Nadu has done a great job. I had exposure to the Silicon Valley, which I... Both my sons used to work there. One still does. And most of the top positions have been taken up with people, say, from his state and neighboring states, which is very commendable. One thing I noticed is that the mindset of some of the Tamil or Malayalis have to change. Because when I went on an official tour to the oh south... Oh, my God. You got... No, when I went to mindset, how will you change the mindset? See, the caste, religion and region. We're not allowing you to enter some temples. We've well, got to only 13 seconds. Could yeah. you please carry on? Yeah, so I'm saying the mindset, if you can change the mindset, how will you go about doing that? To open up your state to other people from other uh, parts of India and the world. Yeah. Okay. How will you make so, it a Bangalore? Yeah, so I, I, Thank you very much. I, I won't go into the temples and all that because we nationalized the temples 100 years back and we probably have better equitable access to temples sure, than anybody. No, but, but, but I'm not saying the problem is solved, but the broader caste problem is um, less in Tamil Nadu than anywhere else. But the access is a different issue. Because we produce so many engineers, if you go to Bangalore, and this is a very important statistic, if you go to Bangalore, no more than 20-25% of the people are local. In fact, 20-25% of the workforce in IT is Tamil. If you go to Hyderabad, maybe 30% is local, 35% is local. If you go to Pune, it's 25, 30. All these other places, they're cosmopolitan by nature. When the investment comes, the workforce comes from everywhere. Even in Chennai, let alone in Madurai or Coimbatore or other places, even in Chennai, 80% of the workforce is Tamil. That's just the market. It's not that we are trying to exclude anybody because we're producing so many engineers. The market is such that most of these people don't have to go anywhere else for work. So we have a profoundly different workforce. Now, there are pluses and there are minuses. Most companies see the plus in the early days, at least, because attrition is low and cannibalization of staff and wage raises are uh, less. So we have a much more stable workforce. People want to work closer to their home. They're not working away and worried about going back, etc. That's the positive. The negative is that it's not as cosmopolitan. So, you know, we don't want to be exclusionary. It's not that we, you know, we are a seafaring culture for 2,000 years. We have always had an international mindset. It's not that we intend to keep everybody out, but if you come into a workforce and eight or nine, and this is in Chennai, if you come slowly, so like 95% Tamil, then you go into a place where everybody else speaks one language and you speak a different language. It's hard to assimilate. So we are trying to find some ways to improve the cultural integration of people, facilitate their you know, rental agreements, facilitate their social activities, uh, make our staff more sensitized to only speak in English instead of, you know, uh, local language inside the office. These kinds of things that will make people feel more welcome and less excluded. But it, it's, it's kind of a rich man's problem. We have so much talent that there's not really that much 
external people coming to work here. That's, you know, it's a plus and a minus. Okay. This moment, I believe that we finished our excellent Time's chat. up. Okay. Time is up. Uh, I want from up the bottom of my heart to thank the minister spending the time with us, presenting all these excellent things. I hope that uh, all of you, the people that they are here, we just uh, heard a lot of very interesting things. And uh, Minister, we are looking very much forward to carry on with the cooperation. I have you back in Greece. My we can invite Frank as yeah, well. Absolutely, absolutely. We can invite yeah. Frank as well, <laughs> yeah. and uh, both our countries to carry on developing together. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much. Thank you for having me. And Thank you. Uh, appreciate it. Thank you. Was okay. Yeah, yeah, you okay. okay. Do we have a picture or something? Yeah.